This is April 16th, 2002. We're in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is John Coates, and we're very happy to have with us today Walter Hall. Walter, welcome. Um, how are you today? I'm fine, thank you. May I ask when you were born? March 12th, 1921. And where were you born? Natick, Massachusetts. Good, that makes you a townie almost. And what is your current address? Centerville, Mass, 02632. So you're down on Cape Cod? I'm down on Cape Cod. Are you retired down there? I retired to Maine first, and then when the grandchildren thought that, that ride to Maine was too long, they asked to be, to have grandma and grandpa come back home a little bit. So we came down to Cape. Good for you. Current marital status? Yes, married. You're married, and mm -hmm. do you have children? Two. And how about grandchildren? You just mentioned you We have had four. Four of them. You're yep. a happy man. Walter, when and where did you enter the military? Uh, so Fort Devens, Massachusetts. Fort Devens? Yeah, for ni October 1942. Okay, October of 42. Did you have any um, choices as to what branch of the service you would join? No, not that I recall. I was just drafted along with a lot of other guys. Just straight into the Army yeah. Fort Devens? Yeah. When you went in, did other guys go with you that oh, you knew from school or neighborhood? No, no, no. All by yourself in All that by sense. myself. Tell us about Fort Devens. What did you do there? <laughs> we just waited for processing, and uh, uh, we were there for probably a day or so, and then they shipped us out. And so they just took your name and address and yeah. figured out where you yeah. would go from there? Yeah. And, and where did you go from there? Uh, from there, we went to Atterbury, Camp Atterbury in uh, Indiana. Atterbury. What mm. kind of place is that? Just a uh, plain boot camp for yeah, the uh, U.S. Army? Yeah, just a plain Army? boot camp, yeah. Do you recall what that was like? Uh, it was pretty good. Uh, we had uh, regular training, infantry training, and we had uh, engineering training, both. So it was, uh, we were busy all the time we were there. Was everybody that uh, was with you being uh, trained as an engineer? Yeah. yeah, everybody was getting the same training. Is there anything back at Fort Devens? Do you remember taking any tests that suggested you should be an engineer rather than no, say, not a that pilot I can recall. Something? Not that I can recall. So they just took a whole shipment of new yeah. recruits. What they had is the unit that we were assigned to was a National Guard unit from uh, Ohio, and they put us in to fill in for the people they needed to make up a, a unit to uh, train for, for the war. At that time, did you have any, um, anything in your mind that you thought this is what you would like to do in the military? Uh, well, as far as the engineering went, I, didn't, I mean, as far as the uh, infantry went, that was your general c uh, procedure that you went through and you trained for that. But uh, then when the engineering came around, it was more interesting. Uh, you were learning how to handle explosives and uh, how to build bridges and so on and so forth. So it made it a little more uh, interesting. Did you yourself um feel you were a, a technical kind of guy, that engineering was what you were good at anyway? No, I don't, no, I don't know if I really felt that way. <clears throat> I, uh, I think that, uh, you know, uh, uh, I was only out of school for a couple of years, and, uh, and I probably hadn't made up my mind what I wanted to do for life work. Uh, so uh, I, I looked at the engineering, and I thought that might be something that would be pretty good to get into as well as being educational and yeah. something that would be yeah. good for you. Oh yeah, you would have to have additional education. You mentioned a couple of things that engineers do, I think, for uh, the purposes of this tape. What does an engineer in the United States Army do? Well, he's up front with the infantry at all times. Uh, you're, you're following them to keep them going. If there's uh, road work to be done, 
there's, we do the road work. If there's bridges to be built, we build them. Uh, over there in France, when we first started, after we came back from uh, St. Lowe, uh, there were hedgerows over there they, that they kept the cattle enclosed in. And uh, we, were use, we were using uh, dynamite to, uh, to blow those hedgerows out so that they could get vehicles and that stuff through. And towards the end of it, then they, they came in with a, uh, a tank with a bulldozer on the front of it and they made the things wider and so on and so forth. So you either went before the infantry to make it easier for them or you came after them to uh, pick up whatever it was yeah they left. they would yeah. uh, they would tell us when they you know when they had a problem trying to get some some place you know and if it was something that we could handle we we did it for them and uh, and uh, like i say blowing the hedgerows uh, we blew those out for them those hedgerows were pretty high because the mounds were about 4 feet high okay we'll we'll get to that in uh, in due course yeah i'd like to go back to indiana for just a second here Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned building bridges. Yeah. And you're a new recruit. Yeah. You've never, I think, built a bridge at that point. How do you learn to build bridges? Tell us a little bit about the instruction. Well, of course, you got. my background, my father was in the building business. And, uh, and we as kids uh, learned how to handle a hammer so that we knew what we were doing when we were around the house. And, uh, uh, we went from there on, and uh, looking at the things we did, we we had to uh, go out into the uh, uh, area that they had assigned to us to work in, and you would cut down trees and trim them and everything and use them for posts to build the bridge on. And then you would continue from there on and you would build a bridge. And uh, when they uh, felt that uh, what you were doing was adequate, then you changed to something else. When you say build a bridge out of trees, and I'm envisioning a, a four-ton tank coming along, how did you know what you built would sustain the vehicles or whatever? Well, they had specifications of what size tree trunks we would use to build the bridge, you know. And you had, if you had two, uh, one on each corner or one in the middle, you had that to take care of anything that was really heavy, and uh, and you went from there on. The the word Bailey Bridge pops up here, yeah, uh, which I think of as a, a pretty portable bridge. That's it is uh, a very good bridge. Uh, did you learn to work on those? We and used make those? we we put a couple of those up over in France. Did you learn to do that in Indiana? Uh, not so much in Indiana because they were just coming through with those then, but uh, we knew what they were and uh, and we knew how to put them together so that uh, uh, they were a very versatile bridge, something that you could just uh, put the sections together. It was almost like uh, uh, toys, you know, and uh, tinker toys. Yeah, yeah, just like them, and uh, you would put them together and then you would. Uh, push them out. We had a bulldozer that belonged to the to our uh, company and you'd take the bulldozer and just put it on the end of it and push it out some more and then we would put some more panels on and so on and so forth. I don't want to overlook the other half of what you were learning. Uh, infantry training. Um, you kind of hyphenated it when we first talked about what you did there at this camp. Um, were you also expected uh, to be an infantryman, to go out and fight, and then use your engineering skills with places you captured. Basically, and took. yes. Yeah. And uh, you had to know what what the situation was, and if you were up in the in the uh, front lines with the uh, with the infantry uh, command, and up at their command post, you had to be able to protect yourself or take the necessary precautions going up there. How about learning to uh, work with explosives? You, you, you talked about dynamite. A yeah, we used ago. dynamite and we also used Primacord. A lot of people don't know what Primacord is. It's just a cord of, that uh, is uh, um, uh, explosives in it 
And like if you wanted to cut a tree down and uh, you didn't have the, a chainsaw or something, you'd take and wrap Primacord around the base of the tree, and then you'd set it off and it would cut that tree off just as nice as could be. Gee, I wish I had some. <laughs> I could use that every yeah. once in a while. Primacord? Just to take down a couple of trees. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's good stuff. This Camp Batterbird, what did you like about it the most? Well, I don't know that I really liked anything, one thing better than the other. It, uh, it was a place to go and, uh, and uh, uh, you had uh, entertainment there of different kinds. You had movies and that sort of thing there and you had PXs that you could go to and, uh, and uh, it survived, I guess, uh, you know, training uh, fellows for... Uh, you were there in the winter time, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I was in there, I was there about, uh, I think, uh, sometime in November, end of October, early November. And we were there till, uh, till spring. Spring of 43? Mm. And then uh, where did you go from there? And we went on uh, maneuvers down south. And after maneuvers, uh, we went to New York. Where's down south? Uh, Kentucky, down south in Kentucky there. And we were down there for a few weeks and uh, then they decided it was time to get them ready to ship them out. And we went. Can you describe a field problem that you were given as a newly named engineer in the Army and then you go to Kentucky? How did they know what you could do? Did they ask you to build bridges or uh, no, not so much. Uh, we like we did a lot of uh, tra infantry training then, and some some uh, engineering, but uh, not not so much as what we did in camp. What what was your rank at that time? Uh, technician, fifth grade. Okay, then you were sent up to New York. Is this still part of a cohesive group? Mm -hmm. Same ones you were. Yeah, same ones. Same ones. And yeah. how did you get up to New York? You took a train one day and. Yeah, yeah, went by train up to New York. And they had uh, places for us to stay right close to the, uh, where the boats were. And when they got ready, we boarded the boats and headed for England. Do you remember what ship you went over on? Uh, let me see. It was a British one, His Majesty. <laughs> I don't know if I remember the name of it. The only thing I remember about it is <laughs> after we got off in England, they'd used it to go uh, down south, south of France there someplace, and the thing got uh, sunk by a German submarine. Boy. So uh, Timing you know, is everything. Timing is, is, is everything, you know, and, you, and of course all the fellows were looking at it and saying, boy, good thing we got off that thing. <laughs> Spring of 43 was not the best time in the world to be sailing across the Atlantic. Were you in a convoy? Yeah. And did you go uh, by way of Nova Scotia? Or straight uh, across? How straight did you... across, more or less, yeah. About a week or so it took you? Yeah, a week or 10 days. Yeah, like and could you uh, tell us about looking out and looking at other ships? Well, they're, they're off in the distance and you didn't know just how many was in the convoy. There was a lot of them, but uh, of course we had a lot of uh, Navy help, you know, uh, uh, watching for uh, ships and uh, and they had these uh, boats that were all ready to attack if they saw a, a submarine or something. And, uh, and so we felt uh, those outside of us, we had uh, protection on the outside. And our boats were more uh, in together in a group. So that... Uh, were, th were these also other uh, troop ships yeah. around yes. here? Yeah. So quite a few of you went over at the oh, same yeah. time. Yeah. Where did you go to? Liverpool. Liverpool. Yeah, we went to Liverpool, England. And uh, we were there for a while, uh, not very long, for a day or two. Then they moved us to uh, some uh, outer areas, uh, out in the, uh, uh, out away from the cities and that sort of thing. Tell us about wartime Liverpool, did you, was this your first look at, say, the war bomb damage? Uh, Blackouts, people who had well, you had hurt. all of those. Yeah, you had all of those. You had blackouts, and uh, 
you could see where the bombs uh, had been dropped and everything, and where they uh, where they did the damage and so on and so forth. So it's starting to get a little serious. Yeah, yeah. But as we went out into the uh, out into the uh, areas that uh, weren't um, well built up, uh, it was more like uh, being out in the field, you know. Were you in tents, camps like that? Uh, not really. No, I don't think so. And how big a place were you uh, stationed at now? Out there? Yeah. Uh, it wasn't very big. Uh, we, we were in amongst towns out there, small towns, and uh, while we were there, instead of uh, doing infantry training, we were hauling uh, gravel for the uh, English there and um, dumping that, uh, helping them make roads, you know, that they didn't have and wanted to resurface or something. Then we'd help haul the gravel for them. Or, uh, they used a lot of cinders, and they would put that down. You say this was for the British. Were you involved in, say, American air bases or any of the bases the Americans were setting up? Not really, no. We didn't, uh, we didn't uh, go to the air bases uh, for any uh, work or anything that we were doing. You went over pretty early, you know, the, the, in, in the first part of 43. Yeah, we spent, uh, we spent Easter on the ocean. And uh, come to find out, they were talking about breakfast that we were going to get and everything, how wonderful it would be. And uh, somehow or other the menu got uh, mixed up and we got smoked herring and, and stuff like that. And uh, <laughs> that was ridiculous. But it wasn't anything that we would have on Nothing it. You'd, you'd generally have at home, was it? No, no nowhere near it. <laughs> What, tell us other work you did. You're about a year away from the invasion of Europe, is that correct? This was the spring of 43? Uh, yeah, no, it was later than that. It was getting, uh, we were only in England for about uh, six months at the most. And for that six months was the, it was uh, doing the, the jobs that I, told you previously that yeah. we did. And uh, then we, we did do some infantry training. We, we did uh, some uh, training of floating a, a jeep uh, across the pond uh, on a canvas and so on and so forth. Did and it make it? Sure. <laughs> no problem at all. It was mine, so it had to make it. <laughs> I didn't want to walk. <laughs> right. Can you tell us that at, at a point where you began to hear that maybe the invasion was imminent, D did you could you see a, a an increased energy around you? Well, I or think you did. Things? Yes, you see uh, you'd see more uh, vehicles and more people that uh, you know that uh, weren't part of your unit or something, and uh, and there would be a lot of traveling back and forth. Where specifically in England were you at this time? Um, I don't remember the name of the towns that we were in, but it was pretty close to uh, Allied headquarters. And uh, we went there from uh, time to time for special information. Did you have any opportunity to uh, meet with the British people and talk with them about uh, the war and the forthcoming invasion? Oh yeah, yeah. We uh, we knew, we met the people long before that. We met them in Belgium. We met English people there, and they talked about it. And uh, uh, excuse we were, me, we've missed Belgium here. Uh, yeah, well, it was on the way. We were in Ninth Army, and we were moving right across the northern part of of uh, of uh, the war. And uh, we were in Belgium. And uh, that was after we had landed over there. Okay, then then let's let's take it sequentially here. Okay. Um, tell us. I, I assume there came a point where you were restricted to your camp, um, 
you knew that the invasion was forthcoming. Yeah, that was only a week or two before the actual... You were all locked up, everybody uh, was. Tell us about that period of time. Well, we were just doing general things around there, and uh, uh, we didn't have too much movement because there was no place to go, or they didn't want want you to go any place, you know, that would be dangerous. So uh, we stuck pretty close to our uh, our areas. The invasion was putting together a huge jigsaw puzzle. Uh, Did you were you briefed a lot about? when you would go over and where you would be and what you would do after you got ashore. Can you, you tell were briefed us about all of that, but uh, not too much. I mean, uh, you know, they would, uh, you didn't go through it a uh, number of times or anything. You uh, went to uh, meetings and that, uh, at that time they would tell you uh, approximately when it was going to happen and that uh, we would be notified uh, before it actually did take place. And then came the time when you heard all the airplanes and you um, got yeah. on board a ship. Yeah. Where, where did you board your ship? Uh, <clears throat> that, I don't remember what the name of the port was, but it was more in line with, uh, with the uh, French coast and <clears throat> in the Normandy area. And uh, uh, there were ships there and uh, of course there was other ships area in the different areas, you know, being boarded by other uh, personnel, you know, that was going to be over there. You boarded the day before or the night before? Night before. Can you tell us about sitting on a ship knowing you were going to take part of one of the greatest invasions of all time and, and, and what you were thinking? It's a big mystery to you. You don't know what's going to happen. You know you're there. You know what you're there for. But you don't uh, really get that much of an, uh, an idea as to what actually does happen. And if you've never been to war before, you have no idea. And you just uh, go about what they tell you to do until such time as the uh, ship takes off. Let me ask you if, if this thought occurred to you. And I, it, you read about everything that happened that more than half a century ago. Personally, were you aware of the fact or knew in your heart that you were taking part in one of history's benchmarks? This was above and beyond, beyond anything that had happened in your lifetime or maybe in history, and you were part of it. Did you feel a sense of that, or you just felt I'm on a boat here and I'm going somewhere? Well, I don't, I don't know if you felt uh, what you were doing uh, was anything uh, specific, but uh, I think what, uh, what happened is you, uh, you were getting ready and you didn't know what was out in front of you. And you listened as much as you could to what you were told and uh, tried to decipher things from that. And uh, uh, I think that that was about all you could do at the time. Especially being a you know a green recruit and everything, and uh, and you didn't know what uh, what was waiting for you on the other side. How were, how were you armed? What weapons did you carry? Well, at one time I carried the M1 rifle, and then uh, uh, when I got over to England, I had a um, uh, they had a small gun that was like a burp gun, you know. Uh, and I, I carried that because uh, in the, I was driving the Jeep at the time and uh, there was no place for the M1 rifle where it would be easy to get hold of. So I had this smaller uh, version of a machine gun and I kept it right on the floor right beside me. When you sailed over and your officers brought you all together and said, you know, tomorrow we're we're going ashore. What were you told you were supposed to do when you went ashore? Uh, we were we weren't really uh, sure what we were going to be doing, but uh, the lieutenant that we had for a uh, officer, <coughs> he uh, he had known what we were going to do, and uh, 
he said uh, he mentioned that we might be going someplace and do some work special for them that they wanted done, which was going to Sherberg and uh, and deactivating any mines up there if they were there, and uh, and then from there we went on to uh, uh, St. Lowell. Okay, tell us about the morning of uh, the sixth of June, and you sailed over and you're off the coast of France. Can you tell us what you saw that day? Well, we saw a lot of um, LSTs there and and a lot of. Uh, infantry getting off, you know, and then they were trying to get all the other equipment that they could get off with it. And uh, uh, they just uh, couldn't handle everybody, you know, so on that day. So they got off the most important ones that they needed to get a beachhead. And uh, we sat on the boat, we watched uh, what was going on and everything, and, uh, and we couldn't get off and do anything until the next day next morning. You told me this morning uh, earlier that you were off of Normandy and uh, you sat on a ship 24 hours waiting for the, the beach to clear. Uh, can you tell us what your thoughts were seeing all that uh, smoke and fire in front of you? Yeah, I think the biggest thought was when are we going to get off this thing so we can get uh, someplace and get some coverage because <laughs> it wasn't a good place to be sitting. You felt vulnerable out in your ship there? Oh, sure, sure. They were dropping bombs all over the place. Were you close enough to be fired at by artillery on the shore? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The German 88 is one of the greatest guns that was ever used in World War II. And you talk to any fellows that were over there that were involved with anything with the German 88, they'll tell you uh, that was a... That was a real piece of equipment. And they were shooting at you? Oh yeah, sure, everybody. Were ships around you being hit? Sure. Were you, yeah. Was your ship hit? No, no, we never did get hit. We were lucky that way. Sitting out there in the channel, you, um, I assume, could see battleships from not only the United States Navy, but from British ships there? Yeah. Yeah, um, there's all kinds. Yeah. You guys had a ringside seat to history, yeah. watching all that going on. That's right. And then came the moment you were going to go. Yeah. Tell us about leaving your ship and going ashore. Well, we were getting uh, unloaded onto a, a LST that was going to take us in, and, uh, and uh, we had been advised ahead of time so that we had all our equipment ready to take with us, um, duffel bags and all that sort of thing. And uh, we just waited there till, uh, till they told us it was okay to get on board and, uh, and uh, we got away from uh, anything uh, that was being uh, uh, bombed or anything like that or any other ships that were being bombed. We didn't have that problem. Was the beach um, secure when, when you got there? That is, had it been uh, the mines well. cleared yeah, and yeah, all of that. Pretty well. So you got your feet wet? Uh, a little bit, yeah. Well, it, that was nothing new. You'd always have your feet wet sometime in, in during the war, and uh, it uh, it was just a thing that uh, you come to live with because there was no way to get around it. You went ashore as part of a squad or a platoon? Platoon. A platoon. Mm -hmm. And where did you rendezvous on the beach or where did you find it? The uh, other guys? Well, we got on the beach there and uh, then we got up away on a, on a road that was there and, uh, and we went so far and they halted us and uh, we just sat there and uh, waited till they wanted to move again, which way they were going to go. Can you describe what Normandy Beach looked like uh, 24 hours after the attack had begun? A mess. Were there uh, burning vehicles, smash vehicles? The uh, smash vehicles, and there was bodies all over the Casualties. place. Casualties. Oh my God! Yes. What about the remains of the uh, the German blockhouses? Did you go by those or th through that particular wall? Uh, not really. The only thing we saw really that uh, we saw some of their barracks that uh, were put up, but the only thing that we really saw was that uh, uh, 
place at St. Low there where they, where that uh, place went down eight, 19, th 19 stories. And uh, uh, it was well built. And it could almost stay there for a very long time. We, uh, we had quite a job getting them out of there to begin with. Is this part of the German fortification? Yeah. 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 Describe that and what you did to uh, help eradicate the, the German army. There. Well, we, we, we put down, uh, we tried to put down some uh, 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 explosives in their air conditioning system because that place had air conditioning and everything else. They had to. They wouldn't have been able to stay there. And uh, uh, we, we used uh, the different pieces of equipment that we had uh, to uh, kind of smoke them out if we could. And it took a while, it took a few days to get them out of there, but they finally came out uh, when they realized that there was no salvation for them. So you were literally a combat engineer. <laughs> That's what they called us. You would look at a a situation in front of you and solve it either as an infantryman or an engineer? You had to use both uh, both sides of the book. If you were in a situation where you had to uh, do think like a an infantryman, you did. If you were on the other side of the book where you uh, looked at uh, things that uh, needed to be done engineering-wise, we did that too. Now you mentioned earlier that you were called. You went over to Cherbourg on the on the peninsula, mm -hmm. and part of your job there was to make sure General Patton was able to land his tanks. Yeah, uh, tell us about that, please. Well, after after we went through there and uh, checked out the uh, underpinning and everything, and made sure that there was no explosives around, uh, they were allowed to bring the boats in. This was in the port itself? Yeah. And the piers that had been badly damaged? Well, Cherbourg was in pretty good shape, and uh, I think that's why they used it. And uh, they got the uh, boats in there, and they came off the boats and onto the pier, and they went up over a grade, probably a uh, good-sized hill. I don't, don't know how many feet up in the air it would be, but. They went up over that, and that was the last we saw of Patton. He just took off. He was gone. <clears throat> Did that checking for safety, <clears throat> excuse me, require you to get down under piers yeah. and look for the uh, stability yep. of yep. the uh, yep. construction? Were you also looking for mines and explosives? And uh, they didn't think there was mines there so much, but they thought they might have had explosives so that you know, if they ran a tank off the pier, the, that it would ex explode and, the, and blow up the pier, you know. But uh, we, didn't, we didn't run into mines so much there. A couple of minutes ago, you uh, talked about being bombed. Were you be under fire uh, at Sherbrooke? No, we were not, there was no, uh, I guess they were too busy tr back at, uh, at Normandy Beach to be bothered with what we were doing, so uh, we didn't uh, get bom bombed there. But you used to have planes that would come in and drop bombs, you know, and uh, you never knew when they were coming or from where. They so just come in. That, that, that's why Bed Check Jolly got his name over there, because he always came at, at just after dark when it was time to go to bed, you know, and, <laughs> and then you'd hear them planes come in there. And, drop a bomber too and then get out of there. These were German bombers coming yeah. after you. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, coming after all of us. Where did you go from Sherbrooke? Out to St. Lowe. And that's where we counteracted those guys that were down in that fort down. That sounds there. like a, a huge installation you described there. Um, this was part of the, the wall that Rommel had built and... Uh, yeah. Well, there was a, there was a good uh, a number of men there uh, that were uh, supposedly going to be used uh, in the war, but uh, they never got into it because they were hemmed in and uh, 
and uh, they, they didn't uh, get out till they decided to surrender. Yeah. So what was your objective then when you left there? Rejoin 9th Army and head for the northern part of uh, the countries over there. We were in part of Belgium at one time. We went through France, of course, to get there. But then we went to Belgium and we went to uh, uh, oh. We went up to the end of the uh, the uh, area there, and uh, then we went from there over into Germany. In Belgium, uh, what did you see and do there? Belgium was a place that we had for a, a first break, so to speak, from the time we got off the boat, and they had a. Uh, the barracks there that the Germans used, and uh, we was going to stay in that. It was at uh, Thanksgiving time, and uh, we went in one door into the uh, to the uh, bar uh, to the uh, showers, and we stripped off everything we had on your shoes, your stockings, your underwear, your suits, your whatever you had, whatever you was wearing, jackets, hats. You went in there, stripped down took a shower, come out the other side, and they gave you a brand new outfit. That must have felt good. Oh, I want to tell you, when, you, when you've been in that outfit that you had on when you left uh, England and been in it till you got up to uh, Belgium, I guess it was. Did you uh, see any Russians there? No. Or were you any relationship with, uh, say, other armies, say the British? French? Uh, we, well, yeah, well, Ninth Army uh, was, uh, had British soldiers in it, so that it was American units and British units making up the Ninth Army. And what rank were you now, Walter? I was still a technician, fifth grade. And had, had your un unit taken casualties? Did any of your f friends or uh, guys in your platoon get hit? No, we were fortunate. Uh, we only lost uh, one fellow, I think, and uh, two fellows we lost. And uh, they were, they, we lost them due to uh, uh, being in an area where we were supposed to be uh, checking foxholes and make sure that there were no units in there, no explosive units. Yeah, and we had uh, we had a group of the fellows there working there, yeah, and uh, uh, the plane came over, and then and they started shelling us a little bit, yeah, and the, these two brothers from uh, uh, from Bo uh, from Maryland, uh, they went and jumped in a foxhole together, and it was one that hadn't been demined, and that was the end of them. Were you at, uh, at part of your work was mine removal? Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, was anything that had uh, you know that uh, required engineering uh, uh, assistance on? And uh, what's we involved in, in taking out mines? They they well, seem like so, so delicate, you know. Yeah, they are, and you have to be careful when you're in there de deactivating them, and make sure that you know what you're doing and. Uh, and you disconnect them the right way so that uh, they don't explode, otherwise you go with them. Had you had special training to, uh, to do that? Well, we had that back in uh, Camp Atterbury, the Longwood Bridge Building and so on and so forth. We had uh, handling of explosives was one of our regular things. Did the Germans booby trap, uh, say, bridges or buildings? And you guys were called in? Oh, yeah, in. They, of yeah. course they tried, uh, and they tried to uh, uh, use them so that uh, when as soon as Americans get on there, the things would explode, and that was the end of them. Did you witness any of that? No, we were at Remagen uh, in Germany, and, uh, and uh, we, um, we were <coughs> waiting to get instructions on what to do as far as the bridge at Remagen. 
Would yeah. you, for the benefit of folks who are not quite sure what that bridge is, the significance of that bridge and what condition it was in when you got to it? Well, it was, it was a bridge that was used quite actively by the, the Germans going back across the, uh, back and forth across the Rhine River. And uh, it was, uh, we were advised that the, they had mined the bridge and everything and they were gonna blow it and so on and so forth. And uh, we were on the shore on the west, uh, west side of it and uh, uh, General Eisenhower came up in a jeep with a group of his command and uh, they discussed the uh, possibilities of what they could do uh, to save the bridge so that they could use it. And uh, they decided that we would take the infantry and salt bolts and take them across, which was part of another part of engineering because we were required to have those assault bolts. <clears throat> and we took them over there and uh, drove the Germans out of there and uh, uh, then we were able to uh, and do what we could to save the bridge, you know. You crossed the Rhine in an assault boat under fire? I didn't, no. no. Uh, but the uh, fellows in the platoon, they had them all picked out that would uh, take the infantry over. And they were able to deactivate a lot of the explosives right. and use the bridge yeah. until a few days later, I guess, yeah. it collapsed and, and killed a lot of engineers, as I remember. Yeah. Well, uh, of course, we didn't, we didn't stay there very long. Once we, got to, once we got across, we were gone. We would be right on the heels of the infantry because we never knew when they were going to need us for something. And, uh, and uh, we did put a bridge up uh, at the end of the uh, Battle of the Bulge, which was coming up. And uh, that was a scary place, and it was in the winter time. Were you at Bastogne itself? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was right from the beginning of the Battle of the Bulge. In fact, uh, we went over there, and uh, there was a unit there that was on the uh, west side that had been pretty badly shot up by the Germans. So they had to get somebody over there, so we went over to, to replace them, and they took those fellows out of there. And we just waited for the, uh, the time when they were going to uh, uh, go through the Hurricane Forest, which was a battle of the bulge. Everything you read about the Battle of the Bulge, it's dead winter. It was. Christmas time, yeah, December you know, of 44. And were you properly equipped so far as clothes is concerned? Did you have good boots? Did you have a top coat, gloves? No. No. We had an, uh, a jacket, three-quarter three length jacket, Eisenhower jacket that you could wear. And uh, you had your uniform, your, your winter uniform on. And you had, uh, uh, you didn't have boots. Uh, you had shoes, you know, that uh, were, had uh, things that came up above your ankles. The top cover of it came up above your ankles. Were you wearing leggings? Is that? No, no, no these are part of the boot, uh, part of the shoe, you know, that uh, sewed right on there. I'm not sure what to ask you about this so many years later, but you looking back at that particular time and you weren't properly dressed against the elements, um, how do you feel about that? We had what we could, what we could use and what we were given and uh, we survived with them and uh, uh, it, was, it was, you know, it was tough in the, in the cold weather and you had to do the best you could and uh, and driving a jeep over there uh, you you never had the roof up because that was not allowed the windshield was down all the time so that uh, the breeze if it was blown it was blown right in your face you know why wasn't it allowed uh, 
too, too easy a target for the Germans to see. Uh, they see the sun, uh, you know, on a cold day even, uh, coming off the windshield of a jeep. It, uh, that was a, a good indication that they better do something about it. So as, as a practical matter, it made you more of a target if yeah. the top was up yeah. and the windshield yeah. was up. Yeah. The only thing you had uh, other than your regular clothes and your jacket was a poncho. Mm. And that fit around your neck fairly tight and it draped down over you and you could drape it over the steering wheel a little bit so that you could uh, uh, drive, the, drive the jeeps around and so on and so forth. Walter, what specifically did you do in the Battle of the Bulge uh, as an engineer or an infantryman? We didn't, we didn't do that much because the infantry was already there and uh, we, we didn't have to put any bridges up or anything in the Battle of the Bulge. We put one up afterwards. And uh, uh, we, uh, we got to a place where we were gonna stay at the other end of the bulge. And uh, the uh, cooks had cooked turkey for a turkey dinner. And uh, they uh, sent a note, uh, sent a fellow around and announced that uh, they had turkey already cooked, but there was no potato and no vegetables. If you wanted to come over and get a leg of of a turkey or some meat, come on over, they'd, they'd serve it to you. But uh, Christmas dinner was not Christmas dinner. <laughs> it was more or less, uh, this is what we got and this is what you're gonna get, so to speak. Did you uh, manage to get some? Oh, sure. Good for yeah. you. Went right over and got it. A lot of the fellas did. They, they were pretty hungry by the time we, we got notified because it was, it was in the evening, you know, around seven, eight o'clock. But uh, they said they were going over and get something to eat anyway, because it'd be hot. It was better than eating uh, canned rations or something like that, which we had a lot of. So you survived the battle and the winter both. Yeah. Spring is finally coming in Europe. Where were you? We were at the uh, up in the uh, river, uh, up in the Elbe, Elbe River area, and that is in the very northern part of. Uh, of uh, Germany and uh, the infantry was held up there because they didn't have any uh, way of getting across the river so the engineers came and we put up uh, the pontoon bridges and see a lot of times we would put up a pontoon bridge and leave it after we got it up and got everybody across that was going across and then the back uh, the engineers from the rear echelon they would come up and put a regular bridge in. But when we put ours up, we, it was right after President Roosevelt died. And, April of 45. Right. Yeah, and we, we put a sign up on the bridge uh, for the uh, new president so that uh, uh, if he ever got over there uh, to see anything that was going on, you know, after we cleared out of there, uh, his name was on the bridge. Harry Truman. And I, I hope he knew that. That was a very thoughtful gesture. Uh, well, I think he probably did. And uh, if he didn't, uh, I think the news would probably tell him that because uh, uh, they thought that was uh, about the best thing they could do and the only thing that they could give it a name for uh, mm -hmm. that would uh, mean anything, you know, to uh, the fellows over there. In April of 45, uh, you're a month away from the war ending in Europe. Mm. Um, are you running into some Russians now? Not yet. You see, the, uh, the, the, uh, the setup between the big three, which was Roosevelt and, and uh, Stalin and uh, uh, what's his name from England there? Churchill. Churchill, yeah. Uh, between the big three, it was decided that the Russians would take Berlin. So after we got the infantry over so many miles into the area towards Berlin, we were halted and we sat there for two weeks because of this agreement. If it had been up to the GIs, 
we would have taken Berlin long before, two weeks before it was taken because uh, we we were all ready to go into Berlin. But uh, the last thing that come down from command headquarters was uh, hold up right sit there. Sit tight, right yeah. Up. Sit tight. Where, where How close were you? Where, where, would, where were you stopped? Uh, offhand, I think it was about six miles away from the by, uh, from the uh, town line, Berlin. Were you on the Potsdam side, or uh, uh, which side were you coming from then? Well, we were coming from the very most northern part of uh, of uh, Germany. And after the two weeks were up, um, what happened to your unit? Well, <coughs> after they uh, after they had taken it, uh, we were allowed to go in there and do some. Uh, uh, investigating and some reconnaissance and see what was going on. So we went in there and we ro rode around for a, for a day or so and stayed there overnight and then came back out again. Then it was time to think about how to get home. Were you on a point system then? Yeah. And you must have had Boku points after all you'd been. Yeah, there. I wanted to go and visit my uh, relatives. My mother and father were Scandinavian. My mother was Swedish, and uh, she had a sister over there and some cousins. And uh, I put in for a uh, pass to go to Sweden for a visit. And I got called into the office, and the commander that we had then was uh, Captain Brand from Rhode Island. And he says, he says, I'd like to let you go to. Sweden. He says, I know what it would mean to you, but he says, you're going home. <laughs> so, so, you, so you, you know, said, oh, when, so okay. do I go home or do I, or do I go to Sweden, you know? So uh, I guess that uh, I ended up in one of the lucky, I think it was Lucky Strike Camp, and we were there for a week or so, and then uh, if you had 86 points or better, you were going home. That's Walter, the, the, that name has come up here in this room several times. Tell us about Camp Lucky Strike. It was just a processing camp where they processed the guys going home, you know. And uh, of course they were bringing them in just as fast as they could put them on a boat and get them out of there. They were using Liberty ships and everything else, you know, at that time. But uh, when it come time for me to go home, uh, I was lucky, the unit was lucky. We got on the SS America really? and came home on that. First class. First yeah. class, all the way. Were you still yeah. part of the same unit oh, you yeah. had started with way yeah. back in Indiana? Yeah. And more or less, uh, can you tell us how many casualties you had suffered? Offhand, I can't. I don't recall. I know we had those two fellows that we lost, and we had one other lost. Uh, doing them during the time that we were building a bridge, but uh, uh, our casualties were fairly light, I would say. And uh, I don't know. I, I, at the uh, at the time we were going home, I think it was the Essex aircraft carrier that uh, was just built at that time, and had come over, and had come over and a little over three days, and the captain said, he says, that's good. He says, now, he says, if we have good weather going home, he says, I'll break that record for him. <laughs> so we were looking forward to going home and getting on that boat and be home in two or three days, you know. And when we got to Boston, it was just a matter of uh, uh, getting rid of all the stuff that you had that you didn't need, and you went back up to uh, Fort Devons and got discharged up there. And that was it? Yeah, that was it. The, the, the ship you took out of Europe took you right to Boston? Yeah. Well, that was good service. I'll say, because we saw an LST that left two days ahead of us, and uh, we, we were in the storm uh, coming home, and we saw that LST go down, and then you wouldn't see it for a few minutes, and then all of a sudden it'd come up over here. By the time we got home, we found out they lost the rudder and they were down Florida someplace. <laughs> well, <laughs> so 
So that was a little different than they had a two-day head start on us, you know. Oh, boy. That's, uh, that's the, the face of war at, at, at its ugliest, yeah. I guess. Yeah, it is. You got discharged in your home. Um, is oh. there a most memorable experience that you can look back on in, in all the time you were in service, but something that stands out more than anything else? Well, nothing, uh, nothing ever s sticks in my mind as much as being on the Rhine River with standing within 20 feet of uh, 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 General Eisenhower. He was a he was a great commander, and uh, when we first got over there, we had to do some work. <clears throat> it wasn't work actually. We had to make some visits to Shafe headquarters, which was the uh, uh, headquarters for the United uh, Organization. And uh, I remember going down there, and I remember seeing him there, and then to see him come up to the to the uh, banks of the Rhine River. That was a little different. Most people uh, wouldn't expect to see him there. And you looked at his Eisenhower jacket and said, gee, I'd like to have one of those. I had one. I have one. <laughs> I still have it. You do? Yes, sir. With I, don't, I didn't carry much home from the war, but I kept my Eisenhower jacket. And uh, when I need to use it, when I need it, when it's cold, I uh, I put it on and uh, go out. So I'm running the snow blower or something like that in the winter time. It still the, works. It just works like yeah. a charm. The hood works fine. You just put the hood up and there's nothing to uh, worry about. What about a memorable character? Is there somebody, some person, that stands out in your recollection of your service? Well, the lieutenant. Uh, uh, and he, he got his uh, captain's bars while we were going across Europe. And his name is John D. Hamft, H-A-N-F-T. And uh, he was from New York. And uh, he was our lieutenant, uh, a platoon lieutenant. And I, I thought that guy had a lot more savvy than, uh, than what I had seen, you know, in the, in the service of different ones. Uh, he knew his engineering, and he knew his uh, infantry training because he had tra he had uh, become an infantry officer when he came in, but then at uh, Fort Belvoir he went on to engineering, and uh, uh, I used to go with him up to the front lines, and I'd be right up in the front command post, which is about as far up front as you can go, you know, and uh, I never worried about going up front with him. I don't know why, but. One time he was telling me, he says, now look, he says, you don't have to duck down every time you hear a shell going over. He says, you listen. And he says, as long as you hear that shell going, shh, 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 he says, don't worry about it. He says, when it stops doing that, that's the time to worry about it. <laughs> so, so that was it. And I, I really liked him. I thought he was a, a very knowledgeable man. Are you in touch with him? No, not lately. I was for a few years, but uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know where he is now. I don't know if he's still in New York or what. What rank did you hold when you were discharged? The same one I had when I left. Uh, when I got to England. And you got the ribbons of uh, European theater, American theater. Yes, we were supposed to get. Uh, <coughs> we were supposed to get a, uh, a ribbon from the French for what we did over there for them and so on and so forth, but somehow the politics uh, took care of it so that we didn't get it. How important to you was serving in the military, Walter? I felt that I was in there to do a job and that's what I was going to do. And uh, uh, I was going to try and protect myself and get home again just as much as I could, but uh, those things you don't know about. And uh, you go through uh, your daily routines and all that, and, uh, and that's, that's the way the ball bounces. If you make it all the way, terrific. It, I know that there's, I've got a cousin over in, uh, 
over in uh, France there, behind uh, underneath one of those crosses over there. And his name is right down here, Gunnar Hall. And he was killed over there. But uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what you'd say. I don't know if it's luck or what it is. Or whether the good Lord said, uh, I don't need you now. Uh, stay where you are. But uh, you don't know about those things ahead of time. Walter, we've, we've been at this uh, just about an hour. And we've had a good talk. <laughs> is there anything that I haven't asked you this morning that you would like to add to this tape? for your family to look at? No, I don't think so. I think everything is pretty well covered there. And uh, uh, as far as I know, uh, the trip across the, to, from Don Normandy on was uh, just something that had to be done. And uh, I just was part of the unit that was doing it. Walter Hall, thank you very much. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Good.